We have a very special guest today. It's our friend from Dagestan. His name is Mohammed. He came from Kazan, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's a student of uh, technical uh, Inopolis school and uh, Mohammed worked on an app connected with Caucasian languages. Caucasian, not a uh, matter of group, but languages of people who live in North Caucasus. That's right. The app is called Avzag, right? right? Uh, so, Mohammed, let's talk about, uh, you'll tell us about the app, how you came to the idea of developing it. And then I think that we'll uh, talk uh, a bit about uh, North Caucasus as a region, about our identity, about our language problems, uh, traditions, uh, religion, and uh, so on. So, uh first of all, uh, tell us about yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then about the application uh, that you developed. Why? What can I say? Came for Saharaj and stayed for podcast. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I'm just an ordinary guy from Dagestan, you know, who like many uh, many other people uh, finished school there. And then when the time has come to obtain a higher degree of education, like many other people, left to Russia. And uh, so the obvious choice for me as a Muslim would be a Tatarstan because of like the culturally it's it's obviously closer region to Dagestan than let's say the, the central Russia. And so, uh, but also that uh, the, our our our, in, our university was kind of a special place within Russia because it was I think the only university at least back then it was I'm not sure as of now but back then it was the only university which was providing education in English, which was kind of important for me because back then I was. I was really looking forward into leaving Dagestan forever and never coming back. But yes, since then many things have changed in the past, so we'll come back to that. So I guess, yeah. Uh, so uh, you uh, graduated from school in Dagestan, from high school in uh, Dagestan, and you told that uh, while graduating you had an idea of leaving Dagestan and uh, never come back. But now you ended up working on an application uh, connected with uh, languages with uh, North Caucasus. So could you a little bit elaborate on the issues that made you change your mind, uh, made you made you feel your identity, North Caucasian identity, Dagestani identity, and work on it? You know, I think it's it's a fairly common phenomena that when a person from from a republic. Uh, goes outside of his republic, which is a fairly homogeneous uh, place with with uh, with usual setting. And you know, the, the point is that w when you live in Dagestan or in Ossetia or in uh, kabardino balkaria or other uh, North Caucasian republics, you typically uh, don't tend to ask the questions about identity and and uh, your noble cause and other such things. Because, like, why would you? Right? You are surrounded by people like you are. Uh, you kind of um, you know everyone, and you you are in your environment. But once you live. And face a big, and face face the big world. These questions arise naturally because, well, you you come there and uh, you see there are people. Well, uh, at least particularly in my university, there are people from all, all over all over the world. Uh, I live with Arabs, for example. My uh, dean is Italian. My supervisor is Kazakh. Mm -hmm. So obviously, uh, we all there are different, but some uh, some people still have certain traits. Some, uh, basically, so it's, it's, it's multicultural environment. Right? Certainly, it is. It is English-speaking multicultural, multi multicultural environment. And so, when you leave from your homogeneous place into such diverse environment, you, this question of identity they arise naturally. Who I am, like where I come from, and and uh, where I'm going. Most importantly, so. So you uh, mentioned a very interesting term, a noble cause. Uh, we uh, have uh, not only Dagestan in Ossetia, I guess in uh, every other, not only uh, North uh, Caucasian Republic, but uh, I think uh, in every Russian region mm -hmm. overall, because uh, Russia is it's very centralized uh, country, so people tend to live uh, from Moscow out of the country, out of their regions, uh, because uh, the economy is better in right. Moscow, um, and regions, Russian regions are overall, overall very poor. Uh, but uh, you mentioned noble cause. Uh, I guess uh, it is uh, feeling uh, your connection uh, with your ground, with your motherland, yes. and uh, acting to uh, somehow uh, push your region forward. Mm -hmm. uh, not to live uh, for Moscow, or in your case, uh, I guess you can live for Europe, uh, US. Uh, I was going uh, for that, yeah. Yeah, and so on. Uh, 
but a noble cause is first of all about responsibility. So uh, could you tell a little bit about this feeling of responsibility, how you came to this uh, feeling and uh, h- how it is going? Mm. These things are always hard to articulate and even harder to uh, reason about them rationally because, well, from, from personal perspective, certainly it would be easier for me, for my career, for my uh, wealth to, let's say, move to Moscow, to London, to Berlin and and. Uh, and uh, pursue my career of software engineer there. But then, you know, uh, the the point I made is that even if I don't leave for Moscow or, or, or for, for Germany, for USA, for Silicon Valley, which is kind of the, the capital of IT of the world, uh, you know, even without me, there will be plenty of bright people who are working hard to, to bring a positive change in, in, in those places. But when it comes to, to Dagestan in particular and the Caucasus in general, uh, I guess, I guess, if I don't stay, uh, who can I outsource this responsibility to? It's not, it, it's, it's not a question of you know. Uh, uh, um, uh, how should I put it? it? It is not because I think that I am the most skilled person. Uh, certainly, I do not regard myself as a savior of Caucasus because obviously I personally know just in Dagestan perhaps a dozen of developers who work on the leading. Uh, developer developer roles in the biggest companies in Russia. But then again, uh, even if those Dagestanians would leave those countries and come back to Dagestan and try to bring the positive change here, uh, the damage uh, that those companies will bear will be practically zero. Those, com- those companies, okay, you know, the liquidity of talents in IT industry is quite high. Uh, people leave, uh, another one comes into his place. But when you, when you, uh, live outside of your homeland and you stay a little bit in this global environment and you certainly uh, become accustomed to best practices and you learn the technologies and you acquire the competences. Uh, for me, the noble cause is then to come back to your homeland and try to apply those those uh, intellectual and uh, material resources to bring the positive change. Because again, if I don't do that, I don't have anyone else to, to outsource, outsource this responsibility to. Mm-hmm. So, so it is about creating an environment here in North C- Caucasus. Cer- certainly it is because, you know, there, there's a famous saying, I think, in our IT IT circles that the Silicon Valley, which is being talked about a lot, it is not a place at the state of mind. And uh, certainly there are no obstacles for us to, to create a similar state of mind, uh, to create a community with a similar state of mind here in Caucasus that would span across our republics. Because obviously uh, the value of some is much more higher than sum of values. Mm-hmm. So if we would succeed in creating uh, the, the, the community that would span, let's say from Abkhazia, from Suhum, yeah, from Suhum to Derbent, that would cooperate and compete with each other, generate new ideas and would create this technological hustle, there will be a huge, uh, huge benefit for us all there. From economical, from cultural, from educational, from any point, I think this is, a noble cause worth pu- pursuing, and this is a noble cause that worth uh, sacrificing your career into. Well, obviously, when I say sacrifice, it's not precisely so because uh, I people might think that you know just because I l- didn't live to let's say Berlin or, or London, I did. You made you, you made a great sacrifice. Yeah, but yeah. this is not the case because obviously, you know, uh, another professor which uh, had a lecture at our university, he is Italian himself. He is a serial entrepreneurship in in uh, Silicon Valley, and he was telling about and he was telling us the model of his company, which I think is really, uh, really amazing and really implementable in the context of Caucasus. So they had their head office, let's say the business operational office in Silicon Valley mm-hmm. in in USA, but their research and design team was in a small a small uh, city at the border of Italy with population with just seventy hundreds. Imagine like. Uh, a, a company that gen- generates uh, billions, Bil- billions, billions of dollars of profit, and I- all of that being made is just by a small company in the outskirts of Italy, a small population. So if they can do it, what stops us? Nothing. Mm-hmm. So uh, your point, and I f- fully agree with you, is that uh, we need an uh, environment here in North Caucasus. This is the first point. And the second point is that uh, in this case, all... Uh, republics, uh, starting from Dagestan, Ossetia, Chechnya, uh, Kabardina, Balkaria, we need each other. Obviously. So uh, we need a common environment where people could communicate with each other and uh, compete. 
compete, compete. competition brings brings innovation brings brings progress so you are a software engineer right mm-hmm. uh, unfortunately uh, there are a lot of stereotypes connected with north caucasus you know you know uh, that uh, in russia and in the world and uh, i think that the stereotypes that are in the world they are mostly based on russian stereotypes about north caucasus because if you ask a random person uh, anywhere in the world uh, what do you think about uh, north caucasus uh, they'll perhaps remember dagestan because of habib right because of uh, mixed martial arts mm-hmm. uh, they could uh, remember chechnya and ossetia because of the wars mm-hmm. uh, that uh, happened here so we obviously have a problem i think a problem of self representation i'm a football fan and i know that a lot of people Uh, they just study football they uh, learn about football tactics from video games mm-hmm. from fifa or pro evolution soccer and uh, so on so uh, do you think that it is possible uh, to do this uh, rep- self representation representation of our region uh, through game industry no there was a funny thing i spotted on on twitter uh, i think right before the last fight of habib mm-hmm. when when <laughs> This was a funny joke. A joke. Uh, this was a funny thing to read. I am not sure if w- whether they made that intentional or not. But the caption to the announcement poster to the last fight of Habib was uh, f- was accompanied by text: "USA versus Dagestan." <laughs> no, not, not not versus Russia, but versus Dagestan. So, so H- Habib actually made Dagestan wo- world known. Yeah, he made it a brand. He made it a brand, and uh, Americans come to Dagestan to train for for UFC, to train for martial arts, because it's it, it, it is indeed nowadays a brand, and brand not just uh, based on hype, but based on real results, uh, by real uh, consistent result, most importantly. So it's not just about Habib; it's about you, you know there was a recent fight of of Islam Makhachev, and Islam Makhachev is one, and there no obviously so it's it's an environment. Uh, Habib Habib is from Dagestan. Yeah is not from any other region mm-hmm. so there is a school a yes. great school of mixed martial arts in Dagestan and it will go on it will proceed of course i think that you are happy about that of course that of course. people <laughs> get to know Dagestan from yes. mixed martial arts but of course you think you dream of more so uh, if you if you let, let's discuss the issue in terms of software engineering in terms of game industry so could we create for example a game a video game about north caucasus not separately about dagestan or ossetia but about north caucasus which could be let's say a world blockbuster certainly we are because you know uh, obviously when i see uh, many games being created that utilize extensively the traditional culture of of japan you know there is a recent blockbuster ghost of tsushima yes it's a world known game and it's 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 really amazing and then there is uh, there is a series of game assassin's creed which in every of its chapter explores different historical cultures so you know the last one was about the Valhalla the the viking setting and one before that was about the ancient greece and one before that was for ancient egypt so certainly why wouldn't we create uh, uh the the game something like assassin's creed that would explore the the circassian the circassian abrek you know that is fighting on the on the on the you know in, in the settings of historical events that happened there over the last couple of centuries and the obvious question there is that we don't have the resources but most importantly we don't have the school because you know what's great about UFC in Dagestan is that you, uh, there is a school of UFC we unfortunately don't have a uh, school of 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 IT we don't have the school of software engineering there are like i mentioned earlier many bright people many really great engineers in Dagestan But they have to live they have to live so individuals it's 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 very hard i don't think it is nowadays impossible for individ- individuals to create anything you have to have a community you have to have this uh this environment which w- will be self replicating and which will be creating well it's it it's basically like a like you know like um, well, it should be a wave that just goes and grows and grows and iterates so as of resources you know uh certainly like i mentioned i would love to see the game akin of ghost of tsushima or, or the elder scrolls that is being set in the context of dagestan because you know dagestan is pretty much the elder scrolls dagestan is pretty much the setting that is that can compete in terms of lore with with uh, the the let's say the world of tolkien because in dagestan you go to any village and there they have their own their own clothes especially when it comes to women and their own language and the stuff but yeah we don't have the resources the material resources and we don't have talents and the the solution to that as i see is starting small then iterating quickly and then uh, like don't stopping to 
to go step by step. Yeah, step by step. So it's iterative process. You know, back then, I think 20, 30 years ago, there was uh, most of the software engineering stuff um, was was conducted by the waterfall module mo model. That is, you first uh, you know make a complete specification of the project, then you make a complete uh, let's say design, then you make complete in, in, in implementation and then integration. So the main uh, outcome of this waterfall model was that uh, the cycle of development from start of development to the very first release, it was counted in years. Uh, instead, now, uh, And today, instead of that, we use agile approach, which basically reduces uh, the, the cycle of release for, for two, three weeks. And I think this is what we need to do. Uh, we should create we should start a game project, something simple, something that uh, doesn't require such extensive resource. Because obviously, the the games uh, they they uh, are cre the, the great games that I mentioned they are created by the multi-billion corpor uh, corporations, which uh, have the stuff numbers counted by by hundreds, which have a lot of resources. But we can't afford that. But what we can afford, we can start from indie indie games which do not require such extensive pool of resources, but nevertheless, they can bring no lesser artistic value and no lesser cultural value to the market. And I think this is what we should start. Let's say even start, start from the simplest thing, something like the visual novel genre, which is uh, technically quite easily implementable. Mm. And I hope we'll do that. I hope we'll do that. So you mentioned about the uh, Dagestani lore. Yeah extremely rich uh, culture. Uh, and, Dagestan, and Dagestan is just a part of Caucasus, Circassia, Ossetia. Yes, yes, we, we have that lore in Ossetia, of course, uh, ve very interesting, mm -hmm. very deep, very uh, ancient. Dagestan is multinational region, but uh, somehow, somehow, uh, we fail to capitalize on this symbolic capital. I Certainly. think that's, that's what uh, separates one from another. Uh, some cultures, of course, they have uh, resources, but uh, they... Uh, have an idea of their symbolic capital, mm -hmm. and they understand that symbolic capital actually means money. You can capitalize on it. Right. Uh, here in North Caucasus, we sometimes um, fail. Not in, sometimes, in I think. Yes, yes. In terms of in terms of thinking, in terms of ideas, we um, will go, go uh, to to the traditions because we sometimes tend to look at our tradition as uh, something that is, uh, let's say, inherited. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, although. Um, as uh, Thomas Elliot once said, you cannot uh, inherit a tradition, actually, you can only win it for yourself. You have to work on it. So uh, we tend to look at it as something inherited and something that cannot change and shouldn't change. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically, uh, what is tradition? What is traditional society? Uh, there is a speculation about traditional society in uh, North Caucasus, although uh, I don't know uh, how can be a traditional society in an urbanized world. And Dagestan is very urbanized, Seti is very uh, urbanized. So uh, traditional society, traditional culture is a culture of traditional society. We don't have it anymore. So uh, I think that the cases of Ossetia and Dagestan could differ in this case. They differ in many regards, actually. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in many aspects, but uh, could you uh, tell us, we are writing this podcast in Ossetia, you are our guest, so we want to learn more about uh, Dagestan. Could you elaborate on the problem of tradition? Uh, in Dagestan and its modern interpretation. In order for us to be able to capitalize on our tradition and to bring that into the modern market, because certainly I believe there is that, that, that there is a demand for for our narratives, for our stories and characters, because the Japanese, the the Scandinavian culture, they are there for a long time, and uh, you can see that histories and characters they repeat uh, in cycles. But Caucasus is basically unexplored land, completely unexplored, unexplored land for a Western. Western and pretty much Russian as well, and pretty much the the entire world. Yeah, sure. Uh, so so mm, so and and when I say we have to respect our tradition, I believe we must take a middle ground in it because you know w w what I have been observing is that uh, well ob obviously obviously when I say that I, I speak from the position of Dagestan because that's what I'm most familiar with. So but but perhaps it is perhaps you will see a lot of similarities in in your republics. So uh, I witnessed two extremes which I try to equally avoid. One extreme is is taking tradition for dogma. That is basically, we must do everything like our ancestors have been doing. So we must live the way our ancestors have lived in 19th century, which is like, which is- Which is impossible, first which, of all. Which is impossible, and even if somehow managed to do that, that is automatic loss. 
automatic laws. You, you can't you can't live the way your ancestors lived in 19th century in 21st century when there is technology. And basically, the world has changed over the last hundred of years more than it has changed probably ever. M maybe a Caucasian of 15th century could have lived the precisely uh, precisely the same way his father have lived in, in in 14th century. But today that's that's not the case for us. So uh, the tradition should should evolve with people, we should reinterpret it, we shouldn't take that for dogma, and we should understand that tradition is the product of human intelligence. So it should evolve with us, we should refine it and maintain critical thinking on that. But another another, uh, another extreme which I see is complete nihilism towards uh, towards uh, your, your, your tradition. There is nothing in that for us, there is no value. We don't need it anymore. Yeah, we don't, it, it, it's a ballast. Why, why would you learn your, your, your history, your language, which is, I guess, the huge part of traditional languages, and uh, when you can just, you know, uh, study English or, or, or French or German and then be more successful in your career and stuff. But, well, uh, there has to be some pride, first of all. And second, you have to respect the experience of your people because even though our ancestors, they were humans like us with their own weaknesses and mistakes, they, they were also doing some things which we can learn from. We will proceed with the language. Uh, what I think uh, about uh, people who uh, tend to be kind of nihilist in terms of tradition, who say that uh, we don't need any tradition, uh, the traditions are dead, so we don't need it. But uh, I think that uh, life in society goes this way. If uh, you if you want to replace your tradition, mm -hmm. you have to replace it with something equally valuable, at least. Right. You have to replace it with something better. Uh, the problem I have with the issue I take with uh, these uh, people, with people who uh, think like that, uh, is that uh, there is nothing they can offer, actually. So uh, they are telling you, uh, your cultural norms are no good, we don't need them. Okay, they are no good. Then offer other cultural norms, right. but uh, they don't have it. And the uh, second issue is that uh, of course, as uh, all, all the Russians, the, as a youth in Russian regions, uh, the North uh, Caucasian youth, uh, they also uh, tend to look more at Europe, at uh, the United States, uh, at the West. Let's uh, say, say it like that. Uh, the West, the Western civilization is based, let's say, on its, its technology, its good education, its good health care, and we could proceed. Mm -hmm. The list goes on and on. Uh, but the thing they, uh, the thing that they are about uh, is um, some kind of freedom. They understand it as a freedom, but uh, actually it's not a freedom, but uh, they just want to move from tradition and yeah. do whatever they want. It leads to a loss of identity, I think. Complete loss of uh, identity. And uh, that's that's the greatest issue with it. If you replace your tradition with something, then replace it with something valuable, with something worthy. But they uh, do not have it. So uh, you mentioned language. Your app is about language. I think that, well, not I think, uh, I think it, it's actually a fact that language is the most important part of national identity, cultural identity. So uh, could you elaborate on the language problems and a language situation in Dagestan? No, before proceeding that, I just smiled because I remembered when you were t telling about uh, if, if you want to drop your culture, you have to, to replace, replace it with something, something better. And, and then I remember the famous meme, you know, reject man to return to monkey, and this is what I yes, said. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, uh, don't do that, guys. Don't reject humanity, uh, which is culture, among other things. So yeah, c coming, coming back to language. Uh, Dagestan is multinational region, so lingua franca in Dagestan is Russian. As everywhere in Russia. Yes, That's yes. Clear. So, uh, how does it affect national Dagestani languages? Oh, Dagestan is a mess in, in, the, in the, with the very beautiful meaning of that world. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, well, certainly we are, we are failing to, to, uh, to adjust ourselves to our, uh, to our modern situation. I think our, our, our urbanization, like you mentioned, plays a, a huge role in that because, you know, Dagestan, how many there, depending on how you count, there are 30 to 40 languages and ethnic groups and when obviously back then for 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 as long as Dagestan exists everyone was living compactly in his mountainous uh, remote villages and that's actually the reason why we have so many languages because people were living quite quite isolated but nowadays over the course of the last 50 years I think over the course of the last 30 years after the close of Soviet Union the urbanization have skyrocketed much went, went on and on yeah, yeah. so you, you think I think it's fair to say that in Mahachkala 
the population of Mahachakala is now. Uh, it's uh, more than a million, right? It, it's it's actually I think million and half. If if you count Mahachakala with its agglomeration. So it's million and a half in Mahachakala. The population of Dagestan is uh, three million. Some maybe three million, three, three and a half million. So basically, half of uh, Dagestan's population is concentrated in. Mahachkala and its suburbs, right? Yeah, and add to it um, the biggest a few other cities of Dagestan, which are located in plain in lowlands, and yeah, you got half of Dagestan soil there. Uh, so, is there any language activism uh, in Dagestan? Because in it is it is very difficult to maintain your language in the conditions that you mentioned. Uh, the the you know, as I study in Tatarstan and I see kind of the uh, the activities that they perform, they they exercise in order to help the Tatar language uh, to sustain. And when you compare that to Dagestan, it's basically like uh, having a state level army and uh, in Tatarstan and having guerrilla warriors in Dagestan. <laughs> yeah, that's what that's what zero level is, right? That's what zero. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, it's it's guerrilla warfare because, uh, well, uh, actually, you know, actually in constitution of Dagestan, I I've seen recently, although don't quote, quote me for that because I'm not sure if the source was reliable, that, but it was written there that the, the paperwork in Dagestan has to be conducted in Russian or, or and, more likely and, the, the dominant uh, language of, of the area. So l let's say if there is a court in, in Avaric regions, mm -hmm. the language of documents has to be in Avar. If there is a court in Lesgi, in, in, in Lesgi yeah, village, Lesgi. it has to be pre performed in Lesgi. But that's obviously not the case. Like, uh, th there is nothing. Uh, th there is, uh, yeah, th there is nothing like that. It's just complete Russian environment. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is basically like that also uh, in Ossetia. Perhaps uh, our situation is just slightly better, slightly better, because we don't have that uh, multi, multi ethnicity. We, we have it, but we have two state languages, mm -hmm. two official languages, Russian and uh, ascetic. So our sentiment is basically about uh, national education, obviously. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, impossible to preserve uh, your language without national schools, without national uh, education. Uh, do you have a uh, sentiment like that in Dagestan? Is anybody thinking about it? And is anybody taking, taking any steps to achieve this this goal and to maintain national schools in Dagestan. I don't think anyone really cares because, like, I think most of the people have really given up on that. Apart from a couple of a couple of uh, madmen who, who do this this uh, futile pursuit towards survival of the tongues, but apart from that, I don't think there is even a, di uh, a public discourse about about uh, the idea of of uh, mm -hmm. of uh, the education, at least the primary school education in, in national language. You know, in Tatarstan they have universities in Tatar. And this is, I think, uh, but yeah, in, in Dagestan, uh, obviously, you know, there was uh, the famous uh, the famous law that was passed a couple of years ago about the voluntary voluntary right to study. The yeah, languages. we call it so-called native languages law. Yeah, and in the, in Dagestan, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how it was in the city. I'm not sure. I don't know how it was in the city, but in Dagestan, there were quite of people who were, uh, you know, who are coming to school saying that, oh, you know, can you, can you just replace our native language, ours, with Russian? So basically they refuse to study their own national languages. Yeah, and I mean, that's of course, emotionally I protest against that, but if you look at it just practically, just from purely, uh, you know, this mercantile um, point, of view. point of view, you can see why this happens, yeah, because the kids have to uh, pass this uh, the governmental exam, and then they have to uh, go into universities, most likely in Russia. And they kind of, they, they, uh, I believe, I believe uh, the parents do it out of the, the 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 because they want their kids to be more successful. But this, this comes obviously at, at a. Um, so if if language is actually a social competence, it has mm -hmm. to it has to have a broad social functions. And uh, the problem that we have, uh, not only in Dagestan and Ossetia, but uh, in all uh, national ru Russian regions, so-called national uh, Russian regions, is that uh, the social functions of our languages are very limited. Mm -hmm. They are limited actually to the street and uh, so on. It is not; uh, they are not used in education. So uh, I think that it's, it's it's a path to destruction actually. And uh, I have I have no idea. I, I can't say that I'm pessimistic about uh, my own language aesthetic. I love it dearly, from the bottom of my heart, and I use it. Uh, but uh, I really don't don't know uh, how the situation will look like, uh, not 
not in 100 years, but in 20 years, yeah. in 30 years, uh, it may deteriorate very, very fast. So you created a language app. It is called Avzak. Mm-hmm. Although you are D- Dagestani, the name is ascetic. I know that uh, you receive a lot of questions about it, why you yes. named your why you named your application in uh, ascetic. Could you a little bit tell us about this application, uh, what uh, it is about, and do you have uh, any plans, any further plans on working on apps or maybe video games? Well, video games uh, created within the context of Caucasus and narrated in Caucasian languages is kind of the higher goal, of which, which hopefully we will pursue, pursue really soon after I finish my education and come back to Caucasus. Like, 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 like I said, like if 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 uh, there are people who there are y- young bright people in Caucasus, or might might not necessarily be in Caucasus, but of Caucasian or origin who who study in in Russia and then think like uh, what they will do after after uh, finishing their degree. Well. Uh, I invite you back to Caucasus to come here and to try to create something together. So if you are a game developer, uh, doesn't doesn't mean you have to have a high skill. But, uh, if you are an uh, artist, if you are a narrative designer, all this kind of stuff that might be useful in creating a game. So perhaps write me or write to Alec or write to Sosal and uh, let's communicate and cooperate. And try we, we have to communicate, of course. Yeah. So yeah, and, and obviously... What is an effective communication without the language? Coming back to the to the to the part about the application. So, the point of this application is is, I think obviously when I was creating it, when I started working on it, uh, uh, I think around two years ago already, I didn't have this 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 notion, but this idea, this conception, it has evolved over time, and now I see that clearly the mission of this project it is to allow people to to uh, connect their languages directly. Uh, mm-hmm. the direct, because you know well, the thing that I'm working on right now is is the dictionary where you can uh, type let's say a word in 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 Jigor Ossetian and receive the word in in Iran Ossetian and obviously this need came out of Dagestan where basically you, you can't find a Dagestani ethnicity which is not surrounded by other three four five sometimes uh, ethnic groups with their own it's languages. very mixed yes. yeah and if, if if back then it was the, the multilingualism wa- was a norm for Dagestan because obviously we had the, the the trade relationships and also prior to Russian conquest the traditional education system of Dagestan was such that you basically moved to 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 uh, neighbor village or maybe not neighbor village and you live there in Maktab which is the the educational mm-hmm. kind of the place uh, by the mosque and then you study with locals there the, the sciences so yeah effective communication is hard without the language and obviously um, when I say effective communication I don't necessarily mean uh, being fluent in the language of your of your uh, you know of your fellow it is sometimes just enough to know a couple of words in other Caucasian languages in order to the change the, the tone of conversation. Uh, just an example, when I was in, in university, I, I kind of saw a guy, he had distinct look, look so, and his accent, I immediately determined that he is Chechen. And obviously, like, I, I was here, I was the only Caucasian here, and when I was Chechen, I was happy, like, I was really happy. And then I, I, w- what I did... I didn't come to him immediately. I just pick up my phone, I searched a, a simple phrase in Chechen language. So I learned r- right there the moment I saw them, him. The next moment I learned that in Chechen, how are you is Helmu mm-hmm. And then I come to him, I, I say Salam Alaikum and ask him Helmu and he and he laughed. So uh, you see, uh, I don't I, I didn't need to learn even, even though of course the knowing language is, is amazing, but even knowing a couple of phrases, a couple of you know those basic words so can it, it make break barriers between people. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and and it, it not just breaks barriers it's uh, in Caucasus we don't need just to break barriers we need to create the ecosystem and in order to, to create ecosystem we we mm-hmm. you know when I say creating ecosystem I don't mean creating I, I don't mean uh, for Caucasus to become the homogeneous society where everyone looks the same and speaks the same language but I mean being aware of the problems of your fellows and being able to at least show that that you, you care about them and language plays a huge role here Yes, you have a point because the problem that we have here in North Caucasus, first of all, I want to tell that you mentioned the term Caucasian. Maybe our, our English-speaking audience uh, uh, could, could misunderstand same. it. Uh, Caucasian in English-speaking world means white people okay. overall, but we uh, use this term in geographical mm-hmm. uh, context. Uh, Caucasian is, for us, is our, our people who come from uh, North, uh, North Caucasus. Uh, the problem we have here in in North Caucasus is, is that we basically do not know uh, each other, and what is even more wor- what is even worse, we do not want 
to know uh, each other. I know that a lot of uh, people from uh, Caucasus republics, they get uh, to know, uh, for example, uh, Ossetians get to know Dagestanis, uh, people from Kabarda and so on, when they uh, enter universities in Moscow. So they come there and they learn that, oh, here are Dagestanis, yeah. but while living in Ossetia or while living in Dagestan, they have no idea about what's going They know that Ossetia, for example, exists right. well, in Dagestan. They know because we are two wrestling superpowers. So we, we, know, we know each other and we travel to each other, at, at, at least wrestlers yeah. do. But uh, we do not know what's happening mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. So a random Ossetian has no idea what's going on in Dagestan. And I think a random Dagestani... Uh, has no particular interest in things that are going in uh, Ossetia. So those ties, we could call them informal ties, horizontal ties, they are somehow broken. Yes. And I think that uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, well, 30 years passed, and only now there is something is starting to go on mm -hmm. in uh, in this uh, case. So what do you think about that? How important is it? to actually know people in other republics. So you see, yeah, about that remark that we Caucasians only become to know each other once we meet in Moscow or in St. Moscow, Petersburg. St. Petersburg, yeah. other Russian cities. And that was precisely the case with me because, you know, I, I spent most of my uh, most of my conscious life in Dagestan and certainly we have uh, the many subjects there and we were studying, you know, the history of, of, of Kiev and Rus, of Novgorod, uh, no, you know, Novgorod Kingdom and and Moscow Principality and stuff, and which and I, I of course don't say uh, don't study that, but on top of that, why we in Caucasus don't study the history of our neighbors, which is directly connected to us? I think this is this is really this is insulting in a way because I only become aware of existence of Circassians when I left Dagestan, and obviously, like coming back to the idea of of, of self identity, I started to read the books and. Uh, Oh, and in Caucasus, in the in the eastern flank of the of the uh, Caucasian War, uh, there was uh, there was at least the, the most famous episode when the the Kabardian prince Muhammad Mirza Mirza Anzorqua he left with Shamil to to Imamate and uh, settled in Chechnya with a couple of thousands of his his uh, well servants. It's not the right word, but let's say his people, right? And 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 only that, you know, I I, I read about Dagestan and then I see the mention about Kabardian prince, and then I'm like, who is Kabardian? Who are Kabardians? So uh, this is how I got, got, how I got to know it, and this is this is really bad. This is really bad. Uh, what? And about your remark that we do not want to know what happens in neighbor republics, I think I'll tell you more. Even people in the who, who live in Mahachkala and Dagestan, they even don't know don't want to know what happens in the mountainous regions of Dagestan. No, it's same here. Yeah. So. We at least, I guess, have to start from there first, or maybe not first, but we have to work on that as well. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the horizontal relations are, 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 are very important. I think in our traditional societies, back to, back to especially Soviet times, when those uh, ties were broken, it, uh, we, had, we, had, we had Kunaks, we had some, you know, the, the network was much more dense, and it was broken, and it is our duty to to restore that because you know I was actually ashamed by that recently when 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 I uh, got to talk with an uh, Turkish Ossetian muhajir and that person told me that in 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 Turkey all, all days uh, the, the Caucasian diaspora they they all call themselves Cherkes because yes. they obviously n n not because they assimilated into Circassians obviously there they know that I am Ossetian I am Chechen I am Avar I am Adiga but uh, they Called that because they share the same identity and the same faith of people being forcefully evicted and uh, you know uh, yeah evicted from Caucasus and uh, they gather together in associations they spend time together they you know they they dance together and eat, eat each other's food and and then after that that person told me when we look at the Caucasus and when we see the uh, how uh, not only there no uh, no collaboration and. Uh, and yeah no collaboration between Caucasian people there is actually the conflicts the the pointless conflicts. And I think we have failed our Mahajars with that, and it, it is the great, great shame. Some for kind us. of way we did uh, to your to your point with uh, uh, Mahajars, Caucasian Mahajars in uh -huh. uh, Turkey being called uh, Cherkis. Uh, you uh, got it right, but there is also other reason. The Cherkis Mahajars they outnumbered yes, uh, Ossetians and Chechens, and that's why uh, they are all mm -hmm. uh, called uh, 
called uh, Cherkes. Uh, the interesting thing that if you, I know you're also a history guy, you like to read about the history of Dagestan, the history of our, our, our region. Uh, if you read about uh, the region, let's say in 18th century, 19th century, at least uh, a setting, a setting sources, uh, sources, uh, there's, uh, there are al- always mentioned uh, connections with neighboring people. Mm-hmm. Uh, although we know that there are no uh, actual, th- th- there was no transport system, modern transport system. So to travel from a city to Kabarda, uh, it's an hour now. Yes. But at that time you have to mm-hmm. go for a day, for two or three. But uh, I had an impression that they knew each other better than uh, we do now and uh, it's uh, of course also despite us having here much more resources both technological and logistic to know each other well you you have yeah yeah social yeah. social networking that's all you have to do but mm-hmm. uh, we we fail to do even that uh, so uh, um, to 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 your point um, we have to create one ecosystem i think and uh, the ecosystem means also uh, one mental system mm-hmm. uh, mental system we have to feel each other, yes. Let's let's uh, say like that and take interest in the problems of uh, each other. So, uh, what are your further plans, Mohammed? You are a student now. It's always hard to talk about plans in this changing. Well, at least sh- yeah. short well, terms. Like I said, finish my degree and then come back to Dagestan because you know uh, the book where I read about Circassians. It's called it's called uh, the the the. Shining of the Mountain Swords. It was. It, it's the finest piece of Dagestani literature, narrated in in Arabic, uh, narrated in Avar, and uh, written down in Arabic. And uh, that book, I think, when you read that book, and you uh, look at the previous generations, how they stood for their for their uh, for their societies, for their people, despite uh, war raging for so many uh, for so many years, despite you know losing everything and everyone, and yet they stood and they were kind of. They fought, fought for generations, actually. Yes, yes. and so how can I do any less? So m- my plan, inshallah, after I finish my, my, my degree, I come back here and we try to create a ecosystem. That's it. Start from small, then iterate with every next cycle, try to expand, incorporate new people, new ideas, new technologies. And, uh, well, not sure we will something will co- come out of it, but at least we will try. So the worst thing is that we try, we make attempt and... Uh, but we have nothing to lose, actually. I mean, not that nothing to lose. There are no, no risks for me. So if we try and fail, nothing happens. There won't be anything worse. Yeah, right. You have to give it a try at least, mm-hmm. in order to tell yourself when time passes that at least at least you tried. At least you tried. At least you tried. So, Mohammed, one, one one region, one ecosystem also means well, common joys, common sorrows, mm-hmm. common problems. And actually, there are a lot of problems that we uh, have in common, that we share. That we share, yeah. Uh, let's uh, say, say it like that. So, uh, working on a language app with an aesthetic name. Well, uh, it is clear that you are not working working specifically on aesthetic language, right? Uh, you know, even if I wanted, I couldn't do so because I do not possess any expertise in aesthetic language. I'm, I, I do not know it, so what can I do there? I think uh, I think this point uh, needs some uh, some comment because it might not be obvious for the majority of people who do not who who only interact with technologies at the end user uh, mm-hmm. level. level. That is, they, they don't see what's happening under under the hood. And you know, in, in order to explain that, I think it might might worth to bring up front a more down to earth example. So, um, you know, people ask uh, why he's working on a certain language. And uh, imagine how, how, how do you answer when you get a question like that? People ask why is Muhammad. No one asks how is Muhammad. So mm-hmm. why? Uh, but yeah, um, mm, say you have a car, and uh, well, that of course would be an oversimplification. But let's say that this car requires the, the necessary requirement for that car to be able to move is that it is being filled with the right uh, with the right fuel, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, the car is a physical machine, and therefore it uh, it um, imposes the physical requirements on its input, that is the fuel. The program, the software, however, from website to your mobile application, it is a, it is a software, it is a logical machine. And therefore, it, is, it uh, requires its input data to possess certain, to have certain logical, logical properties. And uh, uh, the same, I think, as any car 
we don't care about whether the fuel comes from Siberia, from Arabia, from Caspian Sea, for so long as that fuel uh, possesses the necessary chemical properties. The same way, the application, if if properly engineered, we don't care about whether the language data comes from Adigabza or Alonavzak or Lesgich Al for so long as the the data, the input data, possesses certain logical properties. It exercises certain the structure which allows the the software to perform its computations on that data. So I guess this is this is the the answer to that question. I do not work on on Asetian, uh, language app. I work on on the language technology. Uh, so I I work on the language technology, uh, which if it proves to be useful, can then be used to. A broad set of languages, including including Assyrians, because I, I think the fact that from, I'm from Dagestan, it it allows me to see kind of to mm, allows me to design the the things, the contraptions from the start, taking into account other other languages, not only mine, because you know uh, the Dagestan is like I think in many senses, in many uh, in many views, Dagestan is a smaller a scaled down version of Caucasus. Of course, of and course, the same way as. Mm, no language in Dagestan would survive on his own outside of the Dagestani ecosystem. The same thing can be said about the Caucasus, that no Caucasian languages today will survive outside of Caucasian ecosystem. Well, of course, you might say that our diasporas, uh, particularly Circassian diaspora in, in, in Syria, in Turkey, they have been able to preserve the language for, for centuries, but that's, that was... To, s to some degree, let's say it like that, yeah, to some degree. To some degree, and the world was different back then. Mm -hmm. Today today it's different, so we, we need each other to, to sustain so that's it. I create technology, and uh, so yeah, which which happens to be useful for Assetian, including as well. Proceeding with your with your point, uh, the car not only doesn't care about the fuel that yeah. it has, it also doesn't care about the driver. Yeah. So the car is the car; it is technology. So you are basically working on technology. Mm -hmm. But the very question, uh, why why Dagestan is working on a, an application with a static name, it also tells uh, tons about. Uh, kind of painful situation in mm. North Caucasus because uh, why is it strange, for example, why it should be strange yeah, for, yeah. for Dagestani or to work on uh, ascetic language or, for example, for Ascetian to work on Chechen language or English language. Yeah, we should break the stereotype. We should, we should create the new... Because obviously when you say we want to create a system, it's first and foremost the mental model. Yes, mental uh, model. After the mental model, the actions will follow. So, uh, Mohammed, we are coming to, to an end of our podcast. We surely hope that this is not your last visit to Ossetia, to Vladikavkaz. Well, we are sure that it's not your uh, last visit, that you'll come and more, more, our, more of our brothers fo from other uh, regions of North Caucasus will visit. So we get to know, uh, to get to know each of, uh, other. Uh, what can you tell about languages? There is a good saying that uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. I think that applies to language perfectly. Language, languages are meant to be used and I'm sure that our identity, the, the basis of our identities is language. Mm -hmm. So uh, we cannot tell that if you, if you lose language, you lose your identity totally. That's mm -hmm. also not true, but uh, it will be another uh, identity. And uh, I believe that if we manage, if you manage, if uh, other people uh, from our region uh, manage uh, to uh, somehow find find this bridge, this connection between languages and modern technologies and make use of modern technologies, of technologies overall for the sake of our languages, uh, it might be very, very uh, helpful uh, because the Overall, the language situation in North Caucasus, of course, it's uh, far, far from uh, being being good and leaves leaves a lot to be desired. Let's say it like that. Let's put it out softly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, maybe there is something that you want to tell specifically to end to end our podcast. So, don't be passive. Be aggressive when it comes to your your intellectual assets. Uh, protect and develop them fiercely because, well, if you don't do that, no one will. And in the end, uh, you will you will end up being actually, I think, in some sense, worse than others. Because you see, mm, I think I, I think 
I think a lot of people in Dagestan nowadays, obviously for the reasons we've mentioned, they give, they push our children into learning English and 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 French and German and which is which is okay, which is okay, which is amazing because you have to be part of global culture, of course, of culture, course. and 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 you have to take uh, great things from those great cultures into yours. But uh, it's not a mutually exclusive choice because in in the end, you know, if you're talking about English. Uh, basically, to, to learn English nowadays is not a problem. There are plenty no, of not, no, that, yeah, not at all. Not at all. But but if you lose your native tongue, which is ultimately a completely different faculty from the European language, both in terms of the actual the s- syntax, the the language as a language, and also the language as a system of 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 you know of the the mental arsenal, the way of thinking that the the, the entity that shapes your mind. So, uh, if there are two Caucasians. Let's say if there are two Circassians, one Circassian knows uh, his his native Adigabza, another knows Russian, uh, and uh, so he knows Adigabza, Russian, and English. And another Circassian who says, "Okay, you know, I don't know Adigabza. I, I don't need Adigabza. It's just a ballast. Mm-hmm. It's a thing of the past, an obsolete thing. And uh, I'll just push myself myself into learning English and Russian for the career benefits." Then I think it's obvious who, who which one of them would have more mental. Uh, tools in his arsenal. Obviously, the one that knows his his native language. And and if that person decides to learn another, let's say the the, the if if the Circassian who knows only Russian and English, he decides to learn maybe French. That Circassian will easily can then that Circassian can easily pick up French as well. But that Circassian will not be able to pick Adigabza probably unless he really pushes himself for that. So don't 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 go for short term goals. Think think in long term as well. Prominent, prominent Russian writer Konstantin Paustovsky once said that a uh, person, human being, who is ignorant about his uh, native uh, language is uh, actually savage. Mm-hmm. And he probably had a point. So uh, we have a beautiful region with a beautiful culture, with a, with a very rich and deep uh, lore. And I am sure that we have to be very, very protective and very passionate about it. And first and foremost, we have to be very protective and very passionate about other native uh, languages. Uh, right. Well, I'll repeat it one more time. It's all about language. It starts with language. So thank you for your attention. Mohamed, thank you for coming. Thank you as well. It was, uh, it was really good like, you know, to, to talk to other Caucasians. I don't think I had, a, I had a conversation like that ever. So hopefully others will follow with people from other republics. Well, m- maybe next time we'll have someone else with us. Yeah, sure. That will be even more, even more interesting if we have yeah. someone from Kabarda, from Chechnya, I don't know. So maybe if anyone has an interest in joining our conversations, sure. to, let, to, let, to let us know. Okay, thank you one more time.